Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a bit embarrassing to be introduced by your ex-boss, <laughs> for whom I have so much of respect and who was one of the inspirational leaders that I worked under and from whom I have learned so much. So, Vusi, thank you very much. It's an absolute honor to be introduced by you. Um, I'd also like to congratulate Kumulani. I hope I have your name right. I just heard it once. Congratulations on your, on your achievement and I know this is going to be an amazing journey for you and hopefully you're going to come back to South Africa and help us fight the good fight as we move on. And I'd also like to thank Kesak uh, for giving me the honor of presenting to you here at this lecture, um, the sixth lecture in these series. Um, in honor, of course, of Professor Kader Asmal. Professor Asmal, as you know, spent his lifetime dedication to freedom, equality, and justice. And these are not only reflected in our Bill of Rights, but they stand as a beacon and constant reminder of the values we all embraced in our transition to democracy. Values that now, unfortunately, seem like a dream, a distant dream in the current context of the issues that our country faces. Professor Asmar continues to be held in high regard, and you've heard a lot this evening, internationally for his contribution to the processes that culminated in the adoption of the 1996 Constitution, and that serves as an inspiration to all of us. Importantly, he will be remembered for his unwavering integrity. At a time when the culture of integrity in South Africa has been strained to breaking point, and the rule of law tarnished almost beyond recognition. I take inspiration from this and thank Kasek, his foundation, and others for maintaining his legacy through this lecture series and in other ways that you have kept his values and ideas alive. As we consider today the weighty matters of human rights, and criminal justice in our own country. Increasingly, globally, the rhetoric and actions of world leaders retreat from their human rights obligations or show blatant disregard for them. The rise of nationalist sentiment and the promotion of self over the welfare of others reflects a dissent that we cannot allow to go unchecked notwithstanding our own challenges that we face in South Africa. While our constitution stands as a model for other countries, its promises of a wide range of rights and freedoms have yet to emerge as realities for the vast majority of South African citizens. The right to enjoy a better quality of life, free from fear and victimization, simply does not exist. The institutions responsible for ensuring that citizens are protected and that justice is delivered, including the NPA, are clearly failing the citizens of South Africa. Public confidence in government and criminal justice institutions is at dangerously low levels. And we have a very small window of opportunity to turn the situation around before all credibility is lost. Violent crime, as we all know, probably almost every one of you has been a victim of crime or know someone that has been a victim of crime, is destroying families and communities. And unprecedented levels of corruption have ravaged our economy and its current prospects. High levels of inequality contribute to vastly different levels of vulnerability to the problems of crime we face. Yet. We as South Africans, resilient as we are, have no choice but to address these problems head on and with the confidence that we can shift the balance. We must do so in order to meet the most basic constitutional obligations that we have to uphold the rule of law and safeguard fundamental freedoms. Let me dwell just a little bit on the extent to which some of the challenges we face with regard particularly to corruption and violent crime. As you all know, corruption has become so widespread that there is a real danger of it becoming entrenched and normalized in South Africa 
unless something serious doesn't happen soon. For too long, corrupt politicians, government employees, and business leaders have acted almost with impunity to plunder the scarce resources of our country. They have done so in plain sight and in the most brazen ways imaginable. You may know that it's been estimated, well, it's been reported that almost one third of the GDP of South Africa has been lost to corruption. And a large percentage of that already left the shores, have all, has already left the shores of South Africa. Money that would have gone to development, to provision of basic infrastructure for the poorest and most vulnerable parts of our societies. Water, sanitation, um, in basic infrastructure, electricity, housing, in 2019, the Global Corruption Barometer noted that 64% of respondents believe that corruption has increased in the previous 12 months. You will remember that Professor Asmal spoke and acted courageously against corruption. For him, the needs of the people were betrayed too easily through self-aggrandizement and, self and corruption. What would he say if he were here today? In 2008, he resigned from Parliament rather than be obliged to vote for the constitutionally questionable dissolution of the ex-director -direct of, of Special Operations, the so-called Scorpions, which was tasked to deal with corruption at the time and which I had the absolute pleasure and honor to be serving in uh, during that time. It is clear that corruption disables the ability of our government to deliver basic services, as I said, and in doing so, violates the human rights of the most vulnerable of our citizens. Only a clean and honest private and public sector where greed is not allowed to thrive can guarantee us sustained economic growth that creates decent jobs for people. Our constitutional court has recognized that corruption threatens to fell at the knees virtually everything we hold dear and precious in our hard-won constitutional order. In relation to violent crime, as South African citizens go about our daily lives, we do so with a heightened vigilance to violence and crime. These constant feelings of insecurity, which have been extensively reported on in research and in the media, are simply unacceptable as the new normal. The Global Peace Index 2019 ranked South Africa 127th out of 163 countries and districts measured on the list of the most peaceful countries in the world. This is a grim indictment on our beautiful country. Our crime statistics alone, which I remind you reflect only reported crime, show high rates of murder and interpersonal violence, including against women and children. This reflects our failure to meet our constitutional promises relating to the right to life and rights relating to be free from all forms of violence. Overall, a weak economy, high levels of corruption in both the public and private sector, distrust in government, and poor service delivery are closely associated with social unrest, unrest as are the issues of hate speech and xenophobia. We all know that for victims of crime and violence, the criminal justice system has failed them. It has not been effective enough, nor swift enough. You all know this. This is the grim and bleak picture that we face in South Africa today. It is bleak and it is unacceptable. But now let me turn to what I believe is the light at the end of the tunnel. I would not have come back from a very, very peaceful, comfortable life in the Netherlands to South Africa if I didn't believe that there was hope and that we could turn things around. When I was first approached to come to, come to put my name into the hat to be national director, I said no, because I was living a very comfortable life in the Netherlands, enjoying my life uh, in The Hague and working as the legal, senior legal advisor to the prosecutor of the ICC. And anonymity is liberating. And just peace of mind is priceless. And having been with the King Commission, I had some idea of what it meant to be in the public space. 
and to have the media around you. And believe you me, it is the most uncomfortable thing. Having protectors around you that follow you around all the time, your privacy is non-existent almost. And so there was I, enjoying a really comfortable life, and so I said no. And when I was approached the second time, I thought about it, and my son actually spoke to me, and he said, Mom, you are being selfish. He said, you are thinking about the good life that you have in Europe. I was always going to come back to South Africa. I went for one year, and then it became two years, and then it became five years. I was always going to come back, but of late, when I was asked, are you going to come back, I said, yes, but never to the NPA. And so when my son said to me, he said, Mom, you have an obligation to your country. He said, and I realized when I thought about it, it's true. I I don't have a choice in this matter. And I say this because, I mean, it just goes against the grain because I've always brought my sons up to say, you always have a choice and you'd better be ready for the consequences. But in this case, I really felt I owed it to my country to come back. And one might think, okay, so fine, it's not gonna be, you're gonna be giving up. <laughs> Thank you. You're going to be giving up peace of la my, your peace of mind. You're going to be giving up your privacy. You're going to be giving up, you know, all of these things. At least you might get paid more, but I don't. So, <laughs> so anyway, but the point of all of this is, I realize you can't stand on the sidelines and shout. You have to jump in there and do what you can. I mean, when I was interviewed, I said, you know, it's, it's like jumping into a shark tank. And so, you know, I, the sharks are swimming around. I know there will be attacks at some point. So, you know, there, there's no, there's no, I have no regrets at this point having come back. I find that there's purpose in my life now. You don't just wake up every day and go to work. You wake up because you know you have an opportunity to make a difference. Not alone, that sounds too arrogant. It's not me, I can't do anything on my own. We need a whole lot of committed people that can work together. At the moment in the NPA, all that's happened is they put a national director on the top and nothing else has changed. Well, Advocate Cronier has now been appointed as well, but a lot has to change. And I'll talk about some of those things in a minute. There's no question that the solutions are complicated and it will be not easy. It will be neither easy nor quick, but then nothing worth it ever is. As you know, I took office in February this year as the NDPP. And I'm deeply honored to be the first head of the NPA that was selected through a transparent and consultative and public process. As a firm believer in upholding both the spirit and the letter of the Constitution, this, in my view, sets a very important precedent for future appointments, not only for the appointment of future NDPPs, but also for heads of other important independent institutions in South Africa. For almost 10 years of working abro abroad, sorry, after 10 years of almost, after almost 10 years of working abroad, I returned to a divided and weakened NPA and a criminal justice system almost in total disarray. The depth of challenges that confront us both in the NPA and in the criminal justice broader system are very serious. In the NPA, they are well, well known. Instability in leadership, serious allegations of impropriety and even capture against some of the leaders, an exodus of skilled staff, a virtual end to professional develop, development and training programs. Notwithstanding many hardworking and dedicated prosecutors working under extremely difficult conditions, years of instability and loss of confidence in leadership, undue political influence and corruption have led to an inertia in the institutional frameworks of the organization and a serious problem relating to staff morale. Challenges in the broader, and that is just within the NPA, there are huge challenges within the broader criminal justice system. As you know, you may have heard General Labia of the Hawks speaking about the drain of skills from the DPCI and the fact that he also has an establishment of around 4,000 or so and that he has serious shortage of skills. I think he's got about 1,500 out of a, a potential, um, a full complement of about 4,000. So besides the fact that you have s vacancies, you also don't have skills. If you add to that corruption, demotivation, people that just simply don't do the work they should be doing, the skills in government and in law enforcement is extremely low. Since my appointment, I have embarked on a series of efforts 
together with NPA colleagues, government partners, those in civil society, to revitalize the NPA, including its role in strengthening the criminal justice system as a whole. We continue these efforts in the knowledge that the task of restoring public confidence in the NPA, which sits at the center of the criminal justice system, as I said, will not be easy. I have often lamented to colleagues, and now probably to their annoyance, that nothing seems to have, been, to have changed since the 10 years that I left. I said I left 10 years ago and I've come back, and now it seems like time stood still. We have the same problems in the justice system. Much has been done in the 10 years to better integrate and to improve the functioning of the criminal justice system, but he has not achieved the desirable results. And I asked myself, how now can our efforts, can my efforts together with the efforts of a whole lot of people change things? Well, the next chapter of the NPA's history requires a new vision, new energy, and new leadership. I must say that the appointment of a young Minister of Justice is most encouraging. During my first briefing to the NPA staff in February, I said that I thought I had an understanding of the gravity of the challenges and the nature of the corruption threats that we face. I reminded prosecutors that morning that we are lawyers for the people and that the people don't trust us. The people don't trust their own lawyers. I committed to them that we will together turn this around. I have been mindful in our efforts that we need to focus on learning from previous efforts through listening and understanding the needs of my staff and those that we, stir, that we serve. Getting this right has many components, but there are four key pillars. There are four key pillars to my vision for the NPA. And what I've very pleasantly realized is not just my vision, it is a vision of most of the very dedicated prosecutors that are in the NPA. And they are independence, professionalism, accountability, and credibility. Independence. We need a deep commitment to our constitutional obligations and an unwavering commitment to our independence. As I've said before, when I first met with President Ramaphosa, I said to him, Mr. President, I know the Constitution guarantees the independence of the NPA, but we know what has happened in the recent times. And I said to him, I want you sitting across from me to give me your word that there will be no interference in the work of the NPA. And, I, and he unwaveringly said, there will be no interference. And up until this day, there has been absolutely no interference in the executive, uh, from the executive on the work of the NPA. This is a commitment from the president that I will not waver from enforcing at any cost. We are also exploring options on how to further strengthen the, N the independence of the NPA and the office of the NDPP. Professionalism. Effective independence means that we need to get our own house in order first. We need to be a professional organization with the capacity to deliver. Together, my staff, we will work tirelessly with our government counterparts, external partners, including civil society organizations and the private sector to ensure that the NPA evolves into a cutting edge organization that can address the challenges facing prosecutors in the 21st century and facing the country in the 21st century. This will require very hard work, innovation, lots of innovation and perseverance. Prosecutorial accountability is a recognition that the prosecution services derive their powers from the state, which in turn derives its powers from the people. In a democracy, the principle of accountability holds that state officials are responsible to the citizens for their decisions and actions. And the NPA must also, we, I, that any national director must be held, must be transparent about and must be held accountable for the decisions we make. Decisions to prosecute and decisions not to prosecute. The concept of accountability is central to the idea of democratic governance based on the rule of law. The NPA, as I said, must account for our actions. Prosecutors have a lot of power. Also the power to disrupt lives and impact on the rights of citizens. We need to exercise this power responsibly and not abuse it and within the framework provided for by the law and the constitution. 
credibility, as you know, the credibility of the NPA has taken a serious knock over the, the recent times. And we will, I'm confident, be able to restore credibility and to deliver the effective service that we need to because of the commitment of the prosecutors that remain within the NPA. I've often said that in order to be a credible prosecuting authority, it's pointless me standing here and saying to you, I am independent, I am fearless, I am, you know, the Constitution guarantees, I have a duty, etc., etc. We must, by our actions, you must be able to say, look at that independent NPA. Look at the decisions that they've taken. That demonstrates that is a truly independent and credible uh, national prosecuting authority. The NPA is responsible for bringing justice to the victims of crime, fundamental to achieving the human rights objectives in our constitution. Yes, indeed, we need to always prosecute without fear, favor, or prejudice, while maintaining a victim-centric approach. Our current efforts will need to be vastly improved in this regard in order to better serve the people of South Africa. Ensuring that we are able to understand the needs and concerns of our public, we are also trying to ramp up efforts to establish the office, an Office of Complaints and Ethics in the office of the NDPP to deal more effectively with corruption-related allegations against members of the NPA. This is, also provide, is already provided for in the NPA Act. Many of you may, all, well, all, all of you are certainly aware of the establishment of the, of the direct, investigating directorate um, that was announced by President Ramaphosa in March this year. This directorate will, however, deal with one small aspect of corruption. The rest of the NPA, which is seriously understaffed and under-resourced at the moment, will have to still deal with a large percentage of the corruption that has ravaged our country. In addition, asset forfeiture also plays an important role in the fight against corruption. I'm glad I saw uh, Commissioner Kieswetter was here. We've also, together with SARS, been looking. We realize that if we want to deal properly with corruption, we need to have a multi-pronged strategy. I know people are waiting for action. People want to see, so many people say to me, we want to see people in orange overalls. What they don't realize is that it will happen, but when we do it, we must make sure we get it right. Because those that are arrested, those that will be arrested, will certainly hire the most competent silks, maybe your firm of attorneys might be also hired to defend them, people that will pay a lot of money to and make lots of lawyers very rich in fighting these cases. When we d and the, the strategy often is not to, not to deal with the merits of the case, but to fight everything outside of that, deal with the processes, you fight the processes, you fight the people, and you need to make sure that that is done to the T. And people also don't realize that it's not like the criminal justice system has been working so efficiently over the years that now that you have a new national director, the cases are just ready to take to court. You must understand that for years, there was a deliberate attempt not to ensure that these cases were not investigated. There was nothing happening in these cases. And now that everyone's hearing about these things in all of the commissions, the public commissions, they think, why is the NPA not doing anything? When are people going to be arrested? People will be arrested. And I think people do want to also see that the wheels of justice are turning. And we recognize that more than anything, that we have to start, even if it means you start with certain lower levels, you're not gonna go to the big fish immediately. And I'm not saying this is a strategy, but we need to show people that the wheels of justice are turning, and that will happen. But it's gotta be a multi-pronged strategy. So, for example, working with SARS to look at income tax-related contraventions, asset forfeiture, hugely important. Because it's not just about putting people into prison, it's about bringing back the money. As I said, a, it is an insane amount of money that has been stolen by corruption. And we need to ensure that in addition to holding people accountable, we bring back the money. So asset forfeiture, which in the NPA has got more than a 25% vacancy rate, is a very, very important of the strategy to deal with corruption. We are also currently trying to work on to develop additional strategies to improve the performance of the NPA. I'm, I'm just going to touch very, very you know, uh, lightly on this. The performance of the NPA is really very good because if you look at conviction rates, 
The prosecutor is about 80%, 70% in the regional courts, almost 90% in the high courts. So one might say, so what's the problem? You know, prosecutors are doing really well. We have really high conviction rates. And on the other hand, the police, for example, say they, they measure themselves by way of arrests. And they have fantastic measures to say, so the police are doing extremely well, the prosecutors are doing really well, and crime, we're making no impact on crime. So we have to rethink what are the measures, how do we measure ourselves so that we know we are making an impact on crime. I've talked to the National Commissioner as well about us looking at having joint measures. So the police and the prosecutor have joint strategies and joint measures in order to deal with these issues. As I said, the next chapter of the NPA's history requires a new vision, a new energy. We are setting up a strategic support and innovation capacity in the office of the NDPP. We will design it so that it's able to be in touch with best international good practices, sorry, with international good practices, that we're able to anticipate new challenges and we're able to be innovative. There's something, there's no innovation in the system. And that is why I say we need young people now to come, up, to come up with new ideas about how we can start making the criminal justice system more effective. Um, in addition to that, I think I'm going to wrap up because we have a, we have a few minutes for, for questions. So I want to say that we need so much more from not just the NPA, but from our government partners, from yourself as civil society. We need to have partnerships with business and media. If we want to have even a small chance of achieving the president's target of a reduction of crime by 50% in 10 years, departments of justice, health, education, social development, sport, all need to work together, together with civil society, in order to ensure that we, we don't only have reactive, we don't only react to crime, but that our prevention efforts are rewarding us in the process. I want to also acknowledge the role of civil society. We have hugely benefited in, in South Africa from your efforts to expose misconduct in government and in the private sector. Litigations by civil society organizations and others have played an important role in our collective efforts to protect democracy and human rights, and in the process has generated an impressive body of jurisprudence. We owe a debt of gratitude to those of you that have done this. We expect that such civil society organizations will continue, that those that work in the space of accountability will continue with your critical work including holding the NPA and myself as NDPP to account for our actions. Equally, civil society has played a critical role in ass assisting the NPA to do its more work more effectively, and I hope that we will be able to continue with that good re relationship. And hopefully, you will also protect the NPA when it will start come under attack in hopefully the not too distant future. As long as we in the NPA fiercely respect the rule of law and do not violate the values enshrined in the Constitution. If we do, then you've got every right to take us to court. The nature and extent of crime, including corruption in South Africa, and its impact is evident everywhere. It affects the rights of citizens, ordinary citizens, every day. In order to, in everything that we do, our aim to er eradicate corruption, sorry, to eradicate crime, including corruption, has got to be a concerted, coordinated effort if we want to have any chance of turning our country around. We need to work together, government and outside of government, in order to do this without, of course, encroaching on the independence of the NPA. Collectively, we hold the future of our country in our hands. All South Africans are watching and hoping that we can return to a place where justice matters where victims receive justice, and in particular, what most South Africans want to see is that the rich and powerful are held to account. The people of our country are tired, understandably, and they deserve nothing less. The NPA has a vital role to play in the struggle. Together with the judiciary, it is tasked with the defense of the ideals and values enshrined in our constitution. The yardstick of our development as a nation is the devotion to these ideals by organs and arms of state and to all who serve in them, including the NPA. I am confident it's not going to be easy, but the NPA will return 
to being an institution that South Africans will once again be proud of, a trusted and credible institution that puts the rights and interests of victims first, that up upholds fair trial rights, and, that one, and one that is not influenced by political pressure or illicit financial gain. But you can forget about all this that I say. All I want to say is watch us and judge us by our actions. We know that the challenges are immense. But as I've said previously, let us not succumb to despair that the challenges we face are insurmountable. Challenges have always existed, and they will continue to do so. It is in the meeting of these challenges that we fashion ourselves as a nation. I know it won't be easy, but I'm sure that with the support of all good people wanting to fight the good fight, that in five years to come, hopefully not more than that, we can look back and say, we won the fight against crime and corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shamila, uh, for that uh, inspiring. All right, a rousing speech uh, from the head of the National Prosecuting Authority, Shamila Batoi, speaking at the annual Kada yeah. Asma lecture. So just some of the things, I mean, using strong words, saying uh, corruption at a unacceptable levels, violent crime affecting most South Africans, threatening to become the norm. A corruption index is a grim indictment on a beautiful country, an insane amount of money stolen. So being very forthright about where South Africa finds itself, uh, but saying uh, that we have to act resilient as we are. Absolutely. I think very important also there, uh, touching on the credibility of the National Prosecuting mm. Authority, Francis, saying that uh, a damper has been put on it for too long. And very important, uh, you know, a, a tough talk on um, the commissions that we're seeing currently in South mm. Africa. She says people will be arrested but of course uh, saying that once that is done it has to be done properly you often hear people say okay there's a new head uh, of the national uh, uh, prosecuting authority uh, but why are people not being arrested yeah. but what she says is that they're trying to ensure that once those cases go and sit before the courts you have basically got a winnable case so people are waiting in action she says it will happen people will be arrested that's the undertaking from of course Shamila Batoi the national director of a public prosecution yeah and one of her laments which we've heard for a while is that the NPA is still understaffed so yeah. so she needs staff to prosecute these uh, cases talking about that special directorate looking specifically at state capture cases uh, but saying there's a whole slew of other prosecutions that need to take place and she still needs the staff uh, and the money and interesting Chris Elda, yeah. I think this is an indictment on her predecessors saying yeah. people think uh, some of the cases are ready to go yeah. but for years nothing happens so enforcing the perception uh, that previous yeah. leadership was uh, defunct not just a clean-up campaign, uh, Francis, but also a clean-up within the National mm. Prosecuting Authority. She's, of course, talking about that, saying an office of complaints and ethics uh, would be set up, of course, so complaints against those in the prosecuting authority. If you're mm. going to find any credibility uh, of the National Prosecuting Authority, certainly that clean-up would need to happen from inside, and it's something that she said since the appointment... Yeah. Uh, since her appointment to this uh, very important office. All right, uh, so that's where we wrap up Shamila Batoy speaking tonight at that annual lecture. You're with uh, Chris Alder Lewis and Francis Hurd. These are your uh, headlines. We'll bring